intention is to use it as a taster rather than a, a detailed pr presentation of, you know, we're not trying to say this is Middle Eastern culture, history, tradition, calligraphy. I think these are examples of aspects of those. Hopefully leads to people wanting to find out more, to come back again, see what other objects we, we have, and also it leads to people actually coming to SOAS to study. Um, if they come through the door and they, they suddenly realise that uh, they can come here and learn Swahili, or they can come here and um, study development, anthropology, languages, uh, a whole range of subjects that they wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Since this was the first exhibition of its kind highlighting SOAS material, then it should be used as a kind of hook to, to draw people in and therefore what I would call the pretties were put on display rather than a more cohesive historical display. And I also think that very little about the, the fact that SOAS had its own archives and special collections uh, section within the library was really highlighted and there was no real sense that you could then come in and actually look at some of these things and, and handle these objects yourself and use them for your research and that there was more to it than that. I don't think that really came across. I do think that was a bit of a missed opportunity. Basically, the question was asked, what do we actually own? What do we have? And we realised there wasn't an inventory or a record of, indeed, what objects we owned outside of the, the archival material. So we started, so we undertook uh, to make an inventory of everything that we have. Um, and that sort of led and generated its way to the idea that as we were recording this, it was becoming a collection. We collect material that relates to the British experience abroad, um, be that missionaries or anthropologists or lawyers or journalists who were working and living abroad, and the collections that they, they compiled. We aren't interested in collecting um, uh, archives that were generated by other people in their own countries, because we don't want to be accused of um, cultural piracy, if you like. I mean, it is very much a traditional European um, museum-type presentation. Um, uh, and really is just a, a, a selection of interesting objects that we have and that we use and that we study. I don't think they do really represent other cultures. I think they encapsulate the interests of the British in other people's cultures at particular points in, in time. I honestly can't remember why we, we chose to go down the regional route. Maybe it was to avoid accusations of focusing on one particular region at the expense of another. But in actual fact, we ended up doing this anyway, because if you're putting on display historical items like this, you have to deal with the material that is in the collection. You can't just spirit up something because you want to have a bigger, bigger, um, a bigger representation for, say, Africa um, rather than the Middle East. So we had to kind of work with what we'd got. I think that the response is positive, that people come um, and it is an opportunity to see objects that um, they weren't necessarily expecting to. Uh, wouldn't necessarily expect to find here. One of my favourites is the painting by Jamini Roy, the Krishna painting. It's a 1960s piece. It was actually gifted to the school in the late 1960s and was happily hanging on a corridor wall for 40 years or whatever it was before we actually started making this inventory of what objects we've got and it was suddenly worked out what it was and it stopped being just a very beautiful, interesting painting and suddenly becomes uh, more. What I would say was the key item in the collection, which was the Ambari Saheli, which was chosen as the, the front of the, the exhibition catalogue itself. Um, and it is such a treasure, it really is a genuine treasure, that we had somewhat taken it for granted as being part of the family silver, if you like. But again, we had to look, well, where did this object come from? And really, all we know is that it was donated by um, Miss Oosley in the 1920s, and I'm not even certain who she was. She, she donated other items as well. And she seems to have inherited this, this as, as part of uh, the family uh, collection. And there's only one other signature on the actual volume itself. 
So where it originally came from is a bit lost in the mists of time and we have no way of really establishing how it, how it came to be in their possession. But certainly it was commissioned as a mogul piece of art um, and therefore it's more than likely that perhaps during the, uh, the Indian Mutiny or the Sepoy Rebellion or however you want to refer to it, it may have been um, appropriated at that time. There's also um, a very beautiful small Japanese book, which is a book of animals. It shows, um, it's, it's not as grand as the Anvar, and it's not in particularly fantastic condition, but it's a very beautiful book which shows the simplicity of brush strokes in drawing animals. One of the results of the exhibition was that we put on display a map that had been uh, drafted by David Livingston, who was a London Missionary Society missionary. This was the original map that we had in the collection. The bottom half is actually printed, and the printed part is based on Livingston's original drawings that he sent back to England. But if you go up to the top, where it gets blanker and blanker, these bits filled in are actually done in ink by Livingston himself, and, and this was him actually exploring that part of Africa. The reason it's in such a poor state is because he literally had it folded up in his pocket and he was drawing as he went along, so it had to put up with all the problems that he faced while he was on safari. The fact that these objects were being discovered and coming out, that kind of led to the idea of treasures and the fact that they are um, historically, academically, um, not just sort of a monetary valuable objects. It was always known by its working title of the Treasures of Soas. And then in the latter stages of planning, uh, the then chair of the exhibition committee, Tom Tomlinson, who was dean at the time, pointed out that these items might be our little treasures, but in terms of, say, the British Museum, which is just down the road, or the British Library, um, they're really not very important or exciting at all. And so it was a bit, we felt it was inflating um, the, the, the whole exhibition by calling it Treasures of Soas. So then the decision was taken, we should come up with an alternative title. And then the object's instruction uh, went back to the idea that um, the vast majority of the objects in the collections were um, collected and put to the purpose of teaching. I was actually all for, put, for putting on something a bit, I don't know, silly, exciting, something to draw people in. Um, and there were various votes cast as to what we should, we should go for. But in the end, it was decided that a very accurate title would be Objects of Instruction because that's why these items came into SOAS in the first place, because they were to be used for teaching. Um, personally, I still think it's an incredibly dull title, but I guess it's accurate. Now it has been brought to public attention because it's only actually been on, there's only been a public display of the collection since 2007. So before then, all of these objects, if they weren't locked away securely in the special collections archives, if it was non archival material, uh, it was actually just around the school um, in various offices um, and other sort of public areas. And it's actually raising the profile, so it's now a public collection has meant that people suddenly realise that we have a, have a collection, it is on display, that people can come and access it, so people have started offering us other objects and items that might suit. But we can't actually accept everything, um, just because we, we, we wouldn't have the space to put it. There was a huge amount of enthusiasm to put on the exhibition itself, and I think very little thought was given as to what was going to happen at the end of the exhibition. And there was this lovely idea that we would carry on with this small uh, remainder of the exhibition as a permanent or semi-permanent uh, display. Uh, that was fine, except that no thought was given as to who was actually going to maintain this display. And of course, with, with items, particularly with archives or paintings, rule of thumb is that you should be changing them every three months. That's a lot of work. And um, in fact, it fell to the, the manager of the Brunei Gallery, John Hollingworth, who actually stepped in and has kept on maintaining that exhibition today. And in fact, we are going to um, have a discussion about the future of this because it, it is a bit of an issue. 
nevertheless, we want to keep those items out if we can, because it is nice to be able to have something to show people, and it serves as an introduction not just to people within SARS, but people outside of SARS as to what we've got.